Thank you. So as Sam mentioned, my uh, current role is coordinator for the City of Newton and the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and also with Main Street Program. And with the uh, CVB, we coordinate an annual uh, Best of Newton Photo Contest. So just to give you an update, the deadline for that was yesterday uh, evening, and we had 119 entries this year across the two categories. So quite an increase. I think we were at 90, around 91 entries last year. So there's a lot of competition this year, which is really great. Uh, a lot of good images. Uh, they are in the judging process for this week, and uh, we will probably have the winners announced. I'm going to say early next week, around probably the end of October or start of November somewhere in that time frame. So uh, for those who participated and took pictures, I appreciate your entries for sure. Um, and the importance of images and what we do to promote uh, Newton and what city in general do to promote tourism are is very important. Um, you know, it's become a digital world. There's a lot of video uh, that you can shoot on your phone and toss out there in a couple minutes. And you know, that, that's kind of a trend these days. Uh, for people's viewing and consumption, but images certainly play a strong role. If you think about you know, places you travel to, or if you think of St. Louis, you think of a picture of the arch. You know, if, if you've got Chicago in mind, you're probably picturing the bean or the skyline. Uh, Wichita, you're thinking about the keeper uh, and the rivers down there. And uh, San Francisco, you think about the Golden Gate Bridge. So these are iconic images that serve a role still, even though uh, social media has taken off and, and things have gone in a lot of direct, different directions with the way the media is. Um, I was in the newspaper business for more than 30 years. Um, at some times I was paid to take pictures, but I would not consider myself a professional. So if you're expecting technical tips tonight, that is not my uh, uh, strong point. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, Canon had some easy to use cameras uh, that made life simple for me during my days of taking pictures for newspapers and still uh, today. Although I take a lot more photos on, uh, on phones these days than, than I did before. Um, but in photo and journalism for 30 years, uh, Sam called me a photojournalist, but I would not go that far. Uh, it was kind of one of those multitasking, multi purpose uh, roles that I had throughout my career. Probably spent most of my time at a desk uh, producing newspaper pages, like the one on the right side there would be from a, a newspaper in California. Uh, we hosted a uh, soccer tournament, youth soccer tournament from teams all over the West came to play and were there for 10 days. And we spent a lot of time and resources with photos and stories and covering that. And I would be at the desk. Actually, on that page was I took every picture, but one, that one there, the rest of them, I took those um, on a Sunday and then went back and laid out the paper that day. So that's kind of what you do is in at newspapers uh, and write stories and all that sort of stuff. Um, I can remember still the first picture I took uh, at the, was proud of that appeared in the newspaper back in 1988. In the 788 time frame, there was a basketball picture, a uh, kid, high school kid on a baseline going up for a shot. And I'm sure it was grainy and not well lit and not well composed, but I still love that photo all these years later. So um, that kind of jump started things off for me in terms of multitasking, like I said, taking photos, writing stories, doing everything that you have to do in the newspaper world. I uh, put the photo on the left in there just to remind myself that um, for me, uh, I think if there's been a strength when I've been out shooting pictures, it's anticipation, anticipating action and reactions. Um, and fortunately, uh, you know, I grew up around sports for my much of my life and spent part of my newspaper career in sports. And so I always, in major sports I knew, like football, would have an idea, you know, considering what uh, the conditions are, the down and distance, or the what the play, uh, what the baseball field looks like with run on first, and uh, how the ball's hit, and you can kind of anticipate where the action's gonna go and get ready to take a picture at that location. So, you know, like I said, fortunately with the cameras these days, I think there's probably, six photos leading up to that catch and another four or five photos afterwards where they tumble to the ground. So uh, that certainly helps when you have the technology that makes it easier uh, to do those things these days than it was back in 1987. Um, in 2002, I was working for uh, a group of papers in St. Louis area. 
And it was a chain of papers, actually papers around the country, including in Utah, Provo, Utah. And that was when the Winter Olympics took place in Salt Lake City that year. Um, as an employee of the papers in St. Louis, I've kind of uh, lobbied my uh, bosses there that I wanted to go out to Utah. I had a brother who lived there so I could have the housing covered and I could get the credential through our paper in Provo. And I would go out there to take pictures uh, and write stories because there were some actual relevant things for the St. Louis area. Um, and these are some pictures in downtown Salt Lake. And that's downtown Salt Lake at night. They had a uh, Olympic Village downtown where um, all the, a lot of the gathering took place throughout the, um, the Olympics. Uh, the media center was down there. They had concerts every night. Uh, oh, this is 2002 technology. So you've got uh, the ability to put some pictures that were taken and some text messages of that time frame uh, that appeared in the Samsung area here where I think they had a concert going. Um, but obviously, it was uh, 2002 was uh, right after the 9-11 incidents. So part of the, um, the story was the way the security was being handled for the Olympics out there. And that included a number of people from St. Louis who went out to help um, secure the games. Uh, um, there were um, checkpoints at all the venues that you had to go through metal detectors. Um, there were uh, a very stringent badge credential system to make sure everybody was ticketed and had the right uh, credentials to get to where they were supposed to go. Um, so it was a dirt, certainly uh, an atmosphere of high security and safety to make sure nothing happened there. And uh, I did stories on a couple few of our law enforcement officers and volunteers who had gone out to help um, maintain the, the peace out there, as well as some athletes uh, from the St. Louis area that competed. And there were even, I think, some officials that were out there as well. So I tried to track down everyone I could to make relevant local stories. Uh, as you can see, the security made for some long lines. This is getting onto the shuttles to return from a uh, skiing venue outside of Salt Lake City. And these are the credentials of a couple of our police officers who were out there. Um, they had a def couple different cards. You got a barcode system. And this is one of the officers who was working uh, at one of the venues. Uh, the cool thing, as I mentioned about downtown Salt Lake being a media center, uh, for a photographer, and especially uh, one like me who was you know, not that well seasoned at that point in time, uh, they had a really nice setup. So this sweater vest came from some swag that was actually uh, could be zipped into a jacket uh, to keep you warm and, and dry. Uh, they would have monopods. If you needed a, a disc for your camera, they had discs available. They would let you um, loan out long lenses that they had. So they pretty much did everything except to take the pictures for you. Um, they had the setup you could go, come back after the events, plug into their computer, send your photos where they needed to go. So in addition to having on camp on venue uh, uh, some workstations as well, but uh, Salt Lake City also had that, that downtown work venue for everyone to use. And there were some sports there that I was not uh, familiar with. So that took some adjustment in terms of getting used to uh, things like curling. Uh, it's kind of just an atmosphere shot of what the, the ranks look like. Um, again, more curling, that's not, uh, it was kind of cool to learn some different sports, that being one of them. There's obviously a good cult following for curling these days. Um, this is going up the stair, up the uh, chairlift to the Ariel's uh, venue. So Ariel's is going to be, as you'll see on the picture on the left there, uh, they go off of a ramp and do some flips in the air and then try to land, ideally. Mm -hmm. And some, when they're successful, get very happy about it. The gentleman on the right, his name is Joe Pack. He is an American, uh, was born in Oregon. He was kind of the popular hometown guy. Uh, he had spent some time in, in Utah, I think, training for the Olympics. And he finished second that year in the aerials competition. So he played a little air guitar after he got done. There was another sport called, um, I can't think of the full name. It is skateboard or ski, skateboard, snowboard, slalom competition. And they have to do back and forth around these different flags. 
So that was one of the venues I went to to take some photos. And again, uh, the reaction shots is you know, that meant, uh, idea of just staying on the on the competitor after they finish. And when they get through the finish line, to see kind of how they react to their time or what the crowd thinks. And then, of course, the crowd, especially for events like that, you get the big events, you get people dressed up and uh, acting crazy or showing a lot of uh, nationalism and support for their for the athletes. I that photo backwards. I don't know. Uh, pin collecting is a big thing at the Olympics. So I found some places where pin collectors gathered um, and traded their pins or bought and sold them. And then there's the Olympic claim was at the University of Utah Stadium on the hill outside of just overlooking Salt Lake City. And downtown, they also had some different uh, activities throughout the week, uh, weeks of the Olympics so that local people could get involved, even if they didn't have to take it to the games. They could go downtown and, and participate in different activities. I also, with our paper in Provo, I took photos from different venues that they were able to use as well. Uh, speed skating, uh, Apollo Ono was the big athlete at the time, won a gold medal that year in a controversial fashion, but that's part of the fun of that sport is that the short track is kind of like NASCAR on the ice. I remember that was the big hype, Apollo Ono, I remember now. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, that was, it was cool. A lot of people were into the short track speed mm -hmm. skating event. Um, and St. Louis had a couple, they had a, woman, a young woman who competed and a couple of different Olympics, and they had one at the 2002 Games as well. So this is the cross-country venue, which is out in Midway, Utah, outside of Salt Lake, uh, between Provo and Park City area. So the other side of the mountains, a really neat place. I got to go out there a couple of times. Um, I skied cross-country in high school in New York, so it was kind of fun to watch these guys because they were next level, obviously, for their skiing. They had, uh, you know, tried to set up some of the venues with the, uh, um, calling out the Western tradition and uh, recognizing the Native American influence in Utah for its uh, founding. And then uh, this board itself was called, this is Pursuit, uh, which I'm not sure I can remember all the different types of relays and different types of, of cross-country events, but this one is mostly finding a good spot on, on a hill where they come up and, uh, that was probably one of my favorite pictures coming out of uh, shooting up there. So that's all the Olympic stuff. Um, from prior to my switching to uh, the tourism world, I worked in St. Genevieve, Missouri for 10 years. Uh, actually, you owned the newspaper there for a few years. Um, and that was a city that had a lot of flooding issues. They had three different flood um, incidents from 2015 actually the last day of that year, and then a couple, another one in 2017, and another at the end of 2018. So that became kind of a, a dominant theme for our news coverage right there, was flooding and the impact on the people there, the impact on transportation issues um, and agriculture. There was uh, a few buildings were damaged in the course of these floods. Um, some just became unusable, but really a lot of inconvenience, especially for uh, the farmers that had a field in this area. So I'm going to give you a brief geography lesson because it's kind of going to be pertinent to some of the photos that we'll see. So St. Genevieve is located one hour um, south of St. Louis uh, along the Mississippi River here. Uh, as you can see, the river takes a little turn. At one point, it used to flow around here and back to here. But in the late 19th century, it decided it wanted to go into the Kaskaski River Channel. So it took a turn this way and down to the southeast. Uh, kind of some question whether it's going to someday force its way back this way, because it seems like with the flooding, that's what it wants to do. Uh, there is a port here, and we will see some of the photos around that area. Uh, coming up. Um, so in addition to the river change, so now you've got a levee system in place. St. Genevieve was flooded in part of those big floods in 1993, 1995. So they put a levee system in place there. 
There's another levy system around here protecting 6,000 acres of agricultural fields and the state highway. And then there's another levy system around the island here that also has some very good farmland. I think about 12 people live in this island total, but it's a lot of farmland. And then you've got a city down here sitting on the old river uh, that sometimes gets water in it, but usually not very much. Uh, we see, actually got to fly in an airplane in one of the flood events. Uh, I don't believe it was the first one. I think it was around the last one. But typically the river should be over here on this side of these trees. Um, this you can see is the levee that protects St. Genevieve here. It rises to, I uh, can take the river to 50 feet uh, before it floods. You got a flood gate here, got your railroad tracks down into the town. Um, you got a pump station down around here. We'll see in the next picture. Then you got the other levee system down along here, and then the island creek back down further. And this is the pump station. So in St. Genevieve itself, there's actually a couple of creeks and uh, that lead to a pump station. Ideally, the water would still be just a stream out here instead of uh, pressed against the levee like this. Uh, so yeah, one of the fun things about uh, being in the newspaper world and small community like this, you know a lot of people. So one of the gentlemen was an artist uh, and had an airplane. He uh, uh, asked me if I wanted to go up and check out the flooding from above. So. Uh, that was a, a two-seater, very interesting experience. I was thankfully survived and made it through it. And nothing happened to ride a slide plane because that would have been pretty rough. Uh, so this is downtown St. Genevieve. Uh, before the first flood in 2015, the city decided to warn people with an orange mark on various poles that if the levee happened to break as, or get topped and water ended up in the city, that's where it would be. So that made a lot of business owners decide to pack up their things and head out before that risk became a possibility. Um, so St. Genevieve didn't ever did uh, flood that much in the city. There's some flash flooding took place over time. But the one of the lower levees broke, as you can see here. That is the breach in the lower levee. Um, this is actually one of my favorite pictures because if you're standing on this spot, the river is about street level with you, and there's a boat out there that's you know, just like a car going by. Um, but you can see that some of the damage that was done when that levee broke, that was on December 31st uh, of 2015, and the water came rushing in through this field and down into St. Mary. And I'm not sure how how long after it receded to I could get in and take pictures, but I was down there a lot just because the um, the land took on such a another worldly kind of look to it. Um, and when it dried out in the summertime, it turned into like another planet. Um, so this would be where the water comes rushing in from that levee system through the farm fields, the 6,000 acres of farm fields here. Um, and this is a, on top of a high point in Highway 61 in St. Genevieve. So this became kind of a picture gauge of what the flooding would be like at different times, whether you could actually pass through there or not. Um, this would have been a winter flood. So after the December 15th flood break, that's the water uh, reaching into the highway. And that's another flood incident a couple of years later where you again have the water rushed in. They tried to rebuild that flood, uh, that uh, flood wall, the levee between floods, but they only got to 30 feet, and it was topped a couple times after that. So uh, this was down in St. Mary, um, where you got water now in the city, and you got some cars, uh, that used car lot that were damaged. And this is the uh, state legislator came down, actually just happened to be down there. Again, I was down there almost on a daily basis to try to monitor things, make contacts with people. And on one of those incident, incidents, the state legislator just happened to be down there checking things out for himself as well. That would be Second Street. So you, this is where the, the slew of the old riverbed was. So they took water in, and uh, there's like the, the river returned to St. Mary. This would be a bridge on the left to Kaskaskia Island uh, that was uh, topped as well for a time. And that's going to be downtown St. Mary. So the state highway should be running. 
between that uh, brick building and the silo there. And you can see the water um, stop signs. There's part of the state highway there at the foreground. A lot of sandbagging during those incidents. So there's a couple different times where I had to really take pictures of uh, people preparing sandbags or uh, uh, filling sandbags, placing sandbags. And they were um, usually you know, cooperative and didn't have any issues with having their photos taken or a journalist being there, at, being in the community. They knew me for the most part. I knew them. We we're just trying to get the story out of, hey, this is what's going on down there. And say mostly in St. Mary, or this, these are how people are you know, trying to prepare for these flood situations. And you know, these are your neighbors trying to help, but help out with things. The U.S. Coast Guard came in for the first flood. This is going to be obviously right after the Christmas time in 2015. Um, so while their Christmas lights were still in place, made for some uh, decent shots, took a couple of, of like that. Uh, this is one of the other levees that broke in another flood system. So the, the first levee was going to be back up in here. And so you got a lot of water rushing both directions, because actually there's a creek back here too. And back filling right across Kim Town, now about in St. Mary. And St. Genevieve has a they use levee walkers to monitor their levees, make sure that you no know, sand boils are uh, coming through. So that's a uh, shot from the headquarters where they have uh, radios and computers that kind of stay in contact with each other if they spot any uh, water perking up through the levee system and they, they mark it and try and keep an eye on those areas. They actually have volunteers walking 24-7 uh, when they have a flood event like that. And it's always interesting to take pictures of where Water is at a high level where it shouldn't be at all. So this is going to be a, a flash flood incident in St. Genevieve. We got a storm coming in. We already got some high water banks and uh, some uh, heavy, heavily saturated ground. So when that happens, you get uh, storms that have creek flooding within the city. Again, there's there only uh, there are a few houses that have been identified for decades and decades of. They know that this kind of event is coming when it rains. Um, so they're, they're prepared to some level anyway. Um, however, you still shouldn't drive through if you can't tell how, how deep you are. In terms of uh, the Kaskaskia Island, there are people who stay out there through these flood events, even though they're cut off, so it, it, it was a ferry system. Uh, I was able to get on one of the ferries and head out there to kind of monitor, check things out there. They usually get a little water inside their levee. It's kind of hard to see back there. Um, so they put all their equipment up on the high ground uh, so that their farm equipment doesn't get damaged. And you've got a little boat ramp area here. And that's bringing supplies out to them. Again, they have some people on the island 24 seven, kind of making sure nothing uh, bad happens out there. This is gonna be one of the flood walls where you, again, you got the high water pressing against it and uh, got the gates closed for the railroad. So as the water starts to uh, recede, one of the levee uh, districts hosted what they call an open house. They let people come up and walk around on there. Um, I was able to take a boat ride to the backside of it one time. Um, so I had people driving around so they could see how the levee held and kind of an interesting way to celebrate the uh, success of holding back the water. And people are kind of curious like that anyway. So this is the common field, uh, the big uh, agricultural field to the south of town. Um, that I was talking about earlier, where the water rushed through. So it kind of this is really good farmland. Usually, you got soybeans and corn and crops that grow in here. And they had several years of trying to recover from this because of the amount of damage done by the levee break uh, rushing through, and then the subsequent floods afterwards. So they had a couple of years of really not being able to do anything in, that, in those fields. 
you know, dumped all those rocks? Is that? It, yeah, so Levy would have had a uh, riprap rocks on it mm -hmm. and it would have pushed them down into the field, um, you know, knocked down several trees and brushed them down through there. You'll see a little bit more. So this was a, there was a, there was a dirt road through the field, but then they I built a concrete ramp roadway up to a port system. And the water from that flood picked up that slab and moved it down away from the, where it was located in addition to knock it down. Some of the poles, you'll see uh, the power lines right in the, the path of the waterway there were um, pushed down. And then uh, this is from the uh, National Guard was in St. Mary and uh, there were some people in the back of the house there making sandbags to uh, protect their property. And one of the, the National Guardsmen went over to help them out and see how they were doing. And uh, that's what that picture comes from there. And then just to give you an idea how we utilize some of the photos in our paper. So this is going back to 2016 when, you know, before COVID, uh, things were maybe a little better in the newspaper industry than they are now. And so we were able to utilize a lot of photos, a lot of color, and uh, a lot of space to, to talk about the story. So we've got the, some of the photos on front, uh, the guardsmen, uh, some of the levee breaks or levee holding photos. And we did a chart on the bottom of the page that kind of shows the rise of the water levels. <laughs> people, people pay very close attention to the water levels in town like that. And then we did a couple, you know, a couple more pages of pictures. You know, back to the on there. Again, this, so this is again that big field. So this is going to be up where the port road, on uh, top of port road, you see the water kind of came through and did a lot of damage down there. And then this was the part of the rebuild. So in that big field, they had some big holes that were scoured out by the water. They had to rebuild some of that uh, roadways that they had in place beforehand. Uh, we got FEMA coming to town. So a lot of um, a lot of news that continues on for a while. And since we, 2016, they start to rebuild that area that had broken in the first uh, flood incident. Uh, so the, the Corps of Engineers and uh, contractors came in and started repairing that. Like I said, they only got it to a certain level. I think they got about 35 feet. And then you got a couple of years later, actually 16 months later, you got the river back up at 44 feet, breaking right through those same areas again. So it, it continued on. Like I said, they had three incidents over a span of uh, about uh, 36 months. So that concludes the pictures that I have from my program. Oh. Oh. So um, let me turn some lights back on. Let's see, we did have one. Uh, oh, so it's just Sean, Sean Thomas is watching on Zoom. He says, this is really neat. Thank you so much, Toby. So thank you, Sean. You're welcome. And um, so, yeah, um, anybody, um, 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 time for some questions and answers and discussion. If anybody has um, questions, feel free to ask Toby. And I'm looking on Facebook and then I'll look on Zoom as well. So those of you joining us virtually can also ask questions or share your comments. Yes. Your uh, couple of police officer friends from St. Louis, was that a volunteer gig or did they get paid to go down there? They did not get paid for that. Yeah, those were all volunteers, mostly getting time off from their employers or, and really making the case that, hey, there's a need for, they had a lot of people out there for security. And so, I mean, every venue was needed, multiple security. Uh, a couple of those guys were actually stationed at one of the hotels. So even where they were non-venue locations, they had people there to make sure, you know, no one suspicious was hanging around uh, to do damage to even just tourists along the athletes or the venues. So, yeah, did, you, did you run into them quite often or not so much? Uh, not a little too bit. Much. Yeah, maybe a couple of times. Those, the two guys were downtown, so they were nearby the media center, uh, one of the big hotels there. And then the one guy was up at, but the one spot, he was at the Snow Basin Ski Resort, which is probably like 45 minutes outside of Salt Lake City. Um, and I didn't see him other than going up there to, to track him down for a story. 
Uh, a couple guys at Speed Case Skating area uh, went there a couple of times because we did have some St. Louis connections there and athletes and, and officials. So there were some people there I talked to a couple of times. But that was a good time. It was, it was a great time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really neat atmosphere. Um, a lot of fun to be a part of. I love Winter Olympics. That's a, that's a good time. It was the, the transportation stuff was kind of interesting. They did have media buses, so you know you, you got on to to go to the venues, but you know, you're still talking about a 45 minute to one hour ride in some places, and you still got some congestion coming and going. So, well, there must have been hundreds, thousands of media there. I mean, yeah, thousands. Yeah. So, yeah, the, I think the. Um, the U.S. itself, I'm trying to think. I, I was in some of the processes for media credentials. I think they probably did 500 credentials at that point in time. So, like USA Today was getting. Oh, so there was a cap on per, per country, how many? And there's, yeah, and then the, each country, then, like for the, in the U.S., the, the newspapers sit together and uh, they have a whole um, process where you have to apply to say, my newspaper needs two or three credentials because we're covering this, that, and the other. There's a person that we need to cover or sports. So when you got big papers, you got USA Today or Sports Illustrated, you're talking dozens and dozens of reporters. Mm -hmm. And then even, you know, I remember the paper in Lake Placid, New York, would get a couple of credentials because they had athletes from that area who would go there. And then I guess, well, when, uh, like Nico Hernandez, when he was in the Olympics from Wichita, probably the Eagle said, wait, well, hey, we need somebody to cover Nico, mm -hmm. and then they probably sent somebody or something like that. Ideally, I think yeah. the landscape has changed, and I think for newspaper budgets as well, right? To send people to such things, so yeah, uh, they probably rely on a lot more networks and uh, consolidation of the mm -hmm. duties and associated press and those kind of and the good old telephone. Yeah, so, yeah. Are you shooting film or digital or digital? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like very early. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, they would give you the cards to borrow or yeah, give you a couple cards to, to keep. They're probably like the 64 uh, megabyte cards at that point in time. Megabyte? Or megabyte. Oh, yeah. Okay. So could you're you, talking, you're, you're talking three megapixel cameras. Yeah. Yeah. So how many could you like fit like what, 20 photos on the card or something? Yeah, you could probably do a couple hundred, but you could really rotate your cards. Yeah. Okay. You could, you could fill up a card with a couple hundred shots, I think, back in those days. So the files were smaller, I guess yeah, you were like two meg. Piece. Yeah, it was probably two to three meg. It's all right. Back yeah. Back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So you had journalists probably from all over the world covering the Olympics. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was interesting. Each event would have a mix zone they call it at the end, so that where the athletes come off of their uh, performance and they walk through where the media can talk to them for a bit. But yeah, you'd have people from all over the world. Did you get close-ups? You know, you of some of the athletes just after that. Is that where you got your close-ups? Um, could yeah, yeah. Okay. And you were doing interviews and stories too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the athletes in St. Louis were not high-level athletes, so um, I don't think anybody medals. I know there a couple, you know, a couple in the short track speed skating. Um, one may have been on a relay team or medal, you know, but uh, they didn't have the high level like Ono and some of the oh. top level matches. Just to qualify to be in the Olympics is pretty, yeah. pretty yeah. good. So, but yeah, you could get, I mean, you could talk to the athletes and get in here. Some of the bigger ones would have a, they did, they'd bring them to a media room and, and as well where they'd be more people. There was a, I had some pictures, uh, I could not dig them up. And I told Sam it took me a while to find my disc of all these photos from 20 years ago. I have a few hard drives of pictures over the years. Uh, but there was one athlete uh, named Johnny Mosley who did uh, a trick with uh, in, the, in kind of a freestyle competition. And there was a breakthrough trick. And he it was controversial. And he was kind of had that rock star persona. So when he did his interview, they had tons of reporters there wanting to talk to him. It was pretty interesting. But, he, he kind of like that. I think he was pretty good with the attention. Uh -huh. <laughs> Did you have a lot of say as to which pictures got into the papers then? Well, or I did. Did you send the... pictures and some stuff, and then they, of course, put it 
Uh, yeah, so I did for the um, papers and single list, I and mean, those are more of the feature things that I could send the pictures back with the stories. Um, the paper and Provo, I would give them photos every day that they could use. They use some of those as well, um, in addition to having their own staff people out there. So we didn't coordinate too much with them. I kind of filled some gaps, told them where I was going to be that day. And then if they needed something from there, I would take pictures or try to find people from their area. Um, you know, Provo had, uh, I think there's some hockey uh, events going on down there. And then it's not too far from some of these places. So a lot of their local people would be in the crowd at certain things too. It's kind of typical, take a picture of a kid having fun and find out where they're from and send it to the paper sort of thing. So um, how did you um, get into how did you get into to journal? I mean, I just, you know, my when I when I got it, my my newspaper job because I I worked in news, I worked as a newspaper reporter and photographer before becoming a librarian. And um with me, I, you know, I I interviewed as a reporter and and you know, she had my portfolio of stories that I'd written that they read and they thought were good enough. So they hired me. And then my first day, um, my editor you know, handed me a camera and said, hey, "You're, you know, you're a photographer now, so go out and take some photos." <laughs> um, so, was that what it was like for you, or or was it a little bit different than that? You know, yeah, kind of similar. <laughs> I mean, I started writing when I was in high school, and uh, I just always enjoyed writing and uh, telling stories, and so that's how I started with newspapers in high school. You know, in a small town where I grew up, you can only the sports guy can only cover so much stuff, so. Or the news guys couldn't get to so many things. So I would help fill in to places where they couldn't get to. So kind of that stringer freelancer sort of thing. I remember there's a joke that the uh, editor of my hometown paper used to pay me 15 cents an inch, column inch for um, stories. So, you know, you write an inch, you get 15 cents. So stories would get very long. And he said, he published my first book because of the, that policy. But um, eventually, you know, when you're in small newspapers and um, there's only so much you can cover. You, back then, the papers even had staff photographers at that size, but still they could only get to one place at that night. So you take a camera a little later when you're going to cover something just in case something happened or you get some extra art. Mm -hmm. um, but I could never actually, never a darkroom guy. So I always bring my film back to him. Very big guy developing for me. That's part. <laughs> so, like, developer all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess, um, you know, any, uh, I guess, any, any advice that, that, um, for, because, you know, I guess I'm, I think back the, 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 the advice that, my editor Travis Mounts gave me was was pretty practical. Like just if you're if you're in a, if you're shooting at an event, just go right down to the front. Don't be shy. Go down to the front. Get close to the subject. Don't stand in the back of the meeting and try to shoot the photo from there. You know stuff like that. Ad advice that from your career for people that are shooting happenings. You know that might be. Uh, like so I think it's uh, anticipate. You know, try to gauge what the situation is where you're at and what might happen. And you know, if you think about that a little bit, you might know where to point your camera to. And then also kind of keep the lens going even after, you know, like like I showed with some of the athletes, they finish their competition, but they're still might react to something or something might happen where they uh, will, will be picture worthy, whether they're celebrating or they're dejected. You know, and it's the same thing at uh, some meetings sometimes or, or news events where you you want to keep your attention just in case something happens away from where the action is that you might be able to get a picture out of. Hmm. Do you have any photography classes at all? I have not. Uh, actually, I was going to try to get one. I know the photographer, I'm going to think of the lens board, does classes from time to time. To, yeah. yeah. And uh, when we we'll get into one of those, we that's my next. You presenting at Great Plains here a week from Friday, a week from Saturday. At the first week. Yeah, that's so. That's um, is that November? That's November fourth, right? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So twenty dollars per entry. Yeah, so everybody, uh, yeah, don't don't sleep on that opportunity for sure. <laughs> um, I think he's going to do something on cell phone. 
afternoon. Yeah, that's a, I would go to that one if I could. I have a I have a conflict, but that's definitely that's and I think they're just charging like twenty bucks for the whole yeah. day or something like yeah. that. So it's an amazing amazing deal um, to go up to first an opera house, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. 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 Doors open at eight. Uh, show starts at nine. And then he'll do a morning presentation and an afternoon presentation. Hey, did the presentation a few months back. Uh, had a conflict at the time frame, but it was, it was about cell phone photography and how to use that. And it was geared towards tourism. He was, departments. He was going off on a trip oh, about a year ago. And wife goes, where's your camera bag? He goes, well, I'm just taking the cell phone. And she goes, People are these photographers are paying you to be there. You need to at least take some camera gear with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I guess um are there more questions for Toby? But I guess I should say while we're all here, you know, um, since this is the last meeting here at the at the library for this year, I um do I have somebody for January? I have to look at my list. I'm not sure. I think I've got so do, we'll have we'll have meetings in January and February, um, and then March. Well, yeah, and then March um, we're not going to be able to meet at the library because we're going to be moving to the new library. Um, so maybe, um, and I, I think um, I think Carrie's going to maybe you all will want to kind of self organize something or uh, you know I don't know you know what we've uh -huh. done in the past. It's always one of the best first, uh, when we first started this thing, one of the first outings we ever did was the um, back alleys of Newton. That might be a good one to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was fun. That was fun. That was really like fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we did it. We got a little of the alleys when we did the mural walk, and that was really cool just to go back there and get a little bit deeper. That's not like fun. Come on, so. So uh, I think that would be that'd be fun. We could we could probably plan some kind of a a walk or something um, while the library's um, closed. And uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll I'll pull up the spreadsheet and we can start. We can start. So be thinking about everybody. Um, if you uh, would like to get onto the schedule to be a presenter for next year, or have ideas for other people that you think sh should you think should be nominated, you know. Oh, good too. Or ideas for um, field trips or walking tours or anything like that. I know that the wetlands park is opening, and so I think we're definitely going to try to plan an excursion to the wetlands park. And hopefully, I can figure out find a naturalist who can meet us there. I mean, or, or the the Michael B. Rhodes wetlands park. It's where it's by the you know. It's around like the stop as fourteen. Yeah. yeah. Where Southwest 14th Street? Oh, here, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's a new new public park that's going to be opening in Newton. That'd be cool. Yeah. So that'd be they, great. they have all the bird murals uh, are at the now. They have five bird murals, and I think they have an information kiosk to figure out. We're gonna do that and figure out when migration is happening. Yeah. Yeah, I think that springtime is a good time for that. Well, there's different there's different um waves of birth that come through, is what I've read. So there's different fall migration. Yeah, 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 fall migration. Yeah, there's different migrations that come. So into the closer to the sunset or whatever. Yeah. yeah. There's been a nice group of pelicans out in East Lake, if anybody's made it out there or interested. I don't know if they're still there, but they were there a few days ago. Yeah, Toby, you mentioned about the calendar pictures you're doing and stuff. I mean, that's one thing for people to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Start getting ready for yep. the next calendar. Yep. Yeah, every year I, I entered some photos from the library, so we'll see. I'm sure some of you entered too. So hopefully, we'll see how the judging turns out. Yeah. I'm sure the judges are very, very highly qualified. <laughs> yeah, we do have a professional photographer uh, judging this year. Oh, very cool. Yeah. We should ask him if he wants to do a talk for our club. Yes, he hasn't already. Yet. Yeah, who? Oh, if it's a secret, you don't have to say. But <laughs> I wasn't sure if he wants to disclose. Yeah, that's okay. So we don't. So we all lobby him. But anyway, no. <laughs> but cool. Okay. Um, well, I guess unless there's anything else, I'll go ahead and deactivate the live stream now, and um, and we can.
um, we can adjour adjourn, I guess you could call it. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Toby. Thank this you. was a lot of fun. Yeah. And